Well, it's a very exciting day. I am so honored and excited to have this conversation with the amazing Jane Bulware. I'm really excited to talk a little bit about your book today that's coming out in September. Jane, it's been such an honor getting to know you, and I'm so grateful to have you on the show. Back at you, Cheryl. I feel the same way. It's almost like we've had this connection as we've talked back and forth over the months. Um, just a pleasure to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Of course. And so before we get started and talking, you know, I've had the opportunity to read through some of the stories in your book, and we're going to talk about that later and how there's no doubt in my mind that it's going to touch so many people. But before we start talking about your book, and of course, the subtitle is From Cornfields to Corner Office at Microsoft. So can you tell us a little bit about you know, what planted the seed in your mind to write this book? And also from, you know, if you can, you know, in a short amount of time, tell us how did you get from those cornfields to corner office and having all of the impact that you had at Microsoft? That's like five questions, just to be clear. Yeah. So that's how I talk as well. In terms of the genesis of the book, I'll be really honest. I didn't start off in planning to write a book at all. I didn't have like an outline. I didn't do any of those things. When I left Microsoft, the folks that I worked with said, you promise me that you will write, promise us you'll write down these stories. We love your stories and you should just write them down. Write them down for us, if nothing else. Don't be selfish. Write them down. And so that was one thing. The other thing is, you know, the last year I worked at Microsoft, I looked back at my calendar and I had about 27 people that I was mentoring, sponsoring, meeting for lunch, meeting for, for coffee. I was totally caffeinated that year. And whether I met with people that were at entry level or the very most senior people within Microsoft, they all said the same thing, especially the women, which was, I kind of feel like an imposter. I, I don't know that I'm worthy of this role. I don't want to be found out and I want to be more prepared for the next one. The men didn't say that. They said just the opposite. And um, I would also hear throughout my career, I wish I could do what you do. I could never do what you do. If only I had this or if only I, it was like that. And I realized, first of all, that people saw the story of Jane today. They saw someone that was an executive or they thought, you know, her, um, successful and so on. And they didn't see the story of Jane through her career. They didn't, to answer the other question, they didn't see the kid that was born into poverty, the fourth kid in a one bedroom house. They didn't see the kid that went to college and paid for it herself by selling prayers, her mother's prayers and used carpeting and all the other things. They didn't see how I'd worked my way up and how scared I was and how I had to take a lot of jobs that other people said no to because they were too shitty. And I said yes to because I wanted the opportunity and I had to prove myself. And they didn't see that all the way as I came up through my career, there were so many times that I didn't think I could do something that I just went forward and did. And every time I fell down, every time I flailed, somebody came forward and helped prop me back up. And oftentimes it was a person I would least expect it. So if I were to say that I was successful in my career, I don't use that word I. It's always a we because at the end of the day, as you know, um, I genuinely believe together we can do what we could never do alone. But my book, the reason I wrote the book is I wanted to give people a real look at what it takes to go from here to there. Mm -hmm. um, I got a compliment, an unintended compliment the other day when someone said, when I read your book, I can feel your pulsing, bleeding heart on a platter mm -hmm. because I put it all out there including addictions, including all the ugly things that happen behind the scenes. Um, and so that's that's the book. And there are a series of 48 short stories because I didn't weave it together, but the stories do kind of go in order, but you can read them as bite-sized pieces, which is what a format that I like. Uh -huh. Yeah. And so before we start talking about the individual stories, which Honestly, in the ones that I read, and we talked a little bit about it before we went live, but I think so many people are going to see themselves and appreciate your vulnerability and transparency and find hope from where you were to where you are today. And so what inspired you, you know, growing up in a small 
farming town and mm-hmm. you know, what inspired you to dream big and stick with it and i love these stories because of course <laughs> you know, we're speaking the same language whether you know mm-hmm. i'm working with olympians or working with someone like you it's really the same thing you were striving for your olympics and so what sparked your ambition um that's a great question because I got to be honest, if it weren't for a gnarly nun who was able to help me get a $320 scholarship, I might not have gone to college. I I didn't know anything about it. The night before the SATs, I was drinking beer as a kid. And someone said, are you going to the SATs in the morning? And I asked what that was. I didn't know. I I didn't see the ocean until I was 26. I wasn't in a town of 100,000 people until I was a teenager. So I didn't know. um, Very blue collar. I didn't know anybody. What I knew is that um, I wanted to say yes. I wanted to say yes. I didn't want to, there were no expectations for me as a kid. And while I could have been lost in that and just did what I always did, the no expectations also meant no limitations. Mm -hmm. And so um, I left. Mm because there was nothing that was there that I felt like I wanted to be forever. And so I, I left and in the process of doing that, the more people that I met, the more I learned, the more I wanted. And so my inspiration literally met, wasn't a five-year plan that I had. I didn't know about a five-year plan. I couldn't have created a five-year plan. I didn't have a horizon of five years. I didn't know that basil was a real plant and was, it was a real thing. I thought it was made up by McCormick's. I didn't know. Um, what I did know is that I had the courage to say yes when I was scared and unsure. And in doing that, it opened doors and gave me a purview to opportunities that just, I kept putting my foot one in front of the other, which leads me to a a comment that I often get asked or, um, kids that are in high school trying to go to college. I see all the angst. They don't know what they should major in and they don't know which one to go to and all those things. And all I can tell you is, I was one of the top 150 executives at Microsoft, one of less than a dozen women. And I got my degree in forestry from Iowa State University. There are like four trees in Iowa and I got my degree in forestry. So be less concerned about what you, you know, what degree you get as opposed to what you do with it and the opportunities you look for to say yes to. Yeah, I love your transparency and your frankness. And I think that is so, so important. And just to, you know, shine a light on some of the things that you said that are just so important to remember is that, you know, you hear of if you know Jim Rohn, you know, you're the five people that you spend the most time with. But somehow as a young person, you knew that those five people were not in your small town. And something gave you a nudge and said to go. And it sounds like throughout your career, you were remarkably courageous. So where I'm going with this is, you know, if you're an emerging leader or even if, you know, you are a leader and you are need to be heard, valued, respected more by your board, by your CEO, just pay attention to your gut and your heart. Mm -hmm. Um, And it does. It takes it takes a lot of courage. And so. I will say this. um, I didn't shake the dirt from my from my town. I'm very proud of where I came from. They gave me a lot of roots. And by having those roots and I married my high school sweetheart, to be clear, Mm -hmm. 30, 40. Yeah, a long time, 38 years ago now. Um, But because I had those roots, I was able to go with confidence or just to go. I mean, I knew it wasn't there. And I think um, part of the ability to say yes to things and to strive and to grow is creating those around you who believe in you, support you, and will prop you up because you're going to fail. If you're afraid of failing, if you're afraid of not, tr- of if you're for trade, afraid of trying new things, you won't go no matter how much support you have. You got to just put it out there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so I think that's a perfect time to parlay into one of your stories in your book, my favorite so far, but I have a feeling that there's going to be many more as I keep reading, but it's about the pickle bucket. Yeah. And um, you can chime in more, of course, but it really struck me that you did not have a fancy scrapbook or, 
you know, anything, whenever you won something or something happened, it went into a white bucket that I guess used to hold how many pounds of pickles? It was a five gallon bucket. So it hold, it held thousands of pickles. It was yeah. a white gallon bucket that my mom scribbled Jane on the belly of, and it came from Max Cafe. And, and that, that was our, that was our receptacle. It was shoved under the, under the rafters. I wouldn't even say receptacle. I would say that that was something, it seemed like it was very cherished and didn't mm -hmm. you look at it as this is the thing that holds my accomplishments, whether they were ribbons or an A on a test or what did that signify? What did that pickle bucket signify for you? It, it proved that I mattered. I mean, that pickle bucket held everything that I treasured, everything that said I achieved or everything that was, you know, significant to me, all the certificates of for a meat baptism and, and report cards maybe. And ultimately I put Snorty, my, my stuffed animal in there. Um, when he got too kind of too worn out for the precious, you know, he's too precious for me to, for, to, to not keep for the future. And in my family, it was, you know, worth was kind of measured because we didn't have a lot of money by what you, what you did and how hard you worked. So those were examples of, of my worth, really that pickle bucket. I felt like that was, um, the place where I put the things that showed I was worthy. Yeah. And then you didn't, in the book, you go into a little bit more detail about Snorty, who was your confidant, who you would whisper all your deepest, darkest secrets and possibly even consult for advice, which in turn. Oh, yes. Very wise. And what happened. My little girl hopes and dreams were whispered to Snorty, and he agreed with all of them. I know. And so, so my next question might be a little um, reflective and possibly a little uncomfortable, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. But when ultimately everything in that bucket got thrown yeah. away, and how did you feel in that moment, and how do you think it affected you as an adult? I, honestly, I was shocked. So what happened is I had a white pickle bucket and all the treasures of my childhood were stored in there. It was stored in the rafters. And one day, you know, dad cleaned out the attic and, and chucked my bucket um, with the scraps of other things while keeping things that I thought were unimportant. And uh, honestly, I, he was surprised because he didn't appreciate and understand how important that was to me. But it also felt as though I had been marginalized because it was more than it was, it was a receptacle. It felt like I was, it, it, it didn't matter. All the things that I had put in there, it, it marginalized me in, in many ways. Um, and it's funny, it took me a long time to get over that. It really did. Uh, but at the end of the day, and I, I write the book and I start off with the story of the pickle bucket, how I was a child and I filled this bucket. And then I, and I, in some ways felt like I spent my life trying to refill that bucket with achievements and accomplishments and, and so on. And towards the end of the book, and that's why it's called Worthy, I, I really came to appreciate, and final stories are, um, it took me a while to appreciate and understand that it wasn't about what I put in the pickle bucket of my life. It was about what I took out and gave to other people. And the realization that the more I took from my own pickle bucket, what I had learned, what I had done, what I could help others with, the fuller my bucket got, to use that analogy. And that my worth had absolutely nothing to do with my degrees, with my titles, with my paycheck, with any of those things. It, my worth and my, my feeling, I didn't have to earn it. I didn't, no one could give it to me. No one could take it away. It didn't matter if I, and I, in my, in my, I got knocked down a lot through my career and through my life. Um, and I never had anything to prove. And that my worth, when I gave it, when I gave the gifts that I had, become greater. And that, that was really, um, as I think about the pickle bucket of my life and the place that I'm at in my life and my career, I am more energized and more excited now because I've come to the realization and taken all the pressure of having to prove myself and turned it around to helping other people realize the same. So thanks for sharing that. And I can really see how kind of the pickle bucket might relate to if we get anything stripped away from us that impacts our worthiness. Did you ever have anything in your career get taken away that made you skip a beat as far as thinking 
Am I enough? Am I worthy? Oh my heavens. How many hours do we have? I, I will, I will tell you this. I came to Microsoft from being chief marketing officer at Kimberly Clark um, and the head of marketing at Kimberly Clark. And I was recruited for months by Microsoft. Uh, they finally sent my kid to next box trying to get me to, to come on out. So I did. And I was hired on as, as um, the corporate vice president of our online business and uh, like I said, one of the top 150 people in the, in the company, which is you know now 100,000 plus people, so it's kind of a kind of a big deal. There were articles written and so on, and I I didn't make it. I was eaten alive and spit out by the culture, by the people that didn't want me. I was unprepared, and even though my skill set would have enabled me to be successful, I did not know how to navigate an environment that was so hostile that I just, I had to change my thinking and be able to, to plug in. And I had, I, I had to change, I changed to fit Microsoft to be successful. At that time, Microsoft has, has changed in many ways. And it took me a while and it took me falling down and, and accepting a demotion, which I wasn't gonna do, but I did, I was in an accident. It's a long story. I was told I might not walk again. And in the process of doing that, rediscovered to lead in the way that I had gotten me there to begin with, in a way that I was proud of. But I had to go through being brought to my knees and surrendering a title that seemed like the pinnacle of a career, that seemed as though I had made it, and say, it doesn't fit me. The cost of wearing this title doesn't, it doesn't fit me. And not only that, but they don't want me to have this jacket. So it doesn't fit me. They're looking, it, it didn't fit. And, and so part of me feels badly about telling that story because it implies that women can't be successful or I didn't have what it took. Ultimately, it was my choice. I could have stayed, but I wasn't at that time that person and able to do and succeed in a role in a way that was true to who I was and my ethics and my values. And so I stepped away from it. Mm -hmm. yeah, There's so one example. I mean, that's like, that's that's one people, I can't tell you how many people said I was crazy. Don't, don't do it. Best thing I ever did. Yeah, so then it seems like being authentic, what I'm authentic and true to yourself, and also that titles and jobs and exter things external to you, similar to things in a bucket or a pickle mm -hmm. bucket, do not define you. No, and, and, and the corollary to that is once I took an alternate role, led in the way that was consistent with my ethics and my values and what was Jane, that's when I became successful. I mean, honest to gosh, we blew away all of our numbers. We did all the things that people said couldn't be done and created a team that other people that won more awards and were was more motivating and motivational um, that I was proud to be a part of. And I did it and we did it in a way that energized us that I could not. I was excited to get to work for each day. Yeah, that's super, super exciting. And congratulations, by the way. Well done. And I'm sure a lot of people are looking up to you. And as far as looking and reflecting on the path, you know, where they where they should go. And so last question, if you, um, as the wise, experienced, happy Jane today, were to be giving some advice to the 30, 35, even 40 year old Jane, Mm -hmm. What advice would you give her and also some of our other listeners? I should have been prepared or prepared for that question probably, but I, I honestly would say to remember that you are capable, worthy, able, just as you are, and that you don't have to prove anything and that you don't have to have all the answers. To surround yourself with people who supplement your skill sets and respect and admire them and that together you can do anything and nothing is beyond your reach or beyond your your limitations so stop listening to those voices that limit you whether they're your own or others and just do your best and try you are capable yeah so on that i would like to just reiterate that very important message and that's 
Don't listen to those voices in your own head if they're negative. Certainly don't listen to them if they're external to you and that you are capable if you can think it, you can make it happen and just surround yourself by people who are going to be like Jane and also just really step in to help. Jane, is there anything that you would like to share with the audience or tell them to do? Can we share them how to get on a wait list for your book that's coming out in September? Sure. Um, so my book is written, as you can see, and I'm ready to publish it, but I've been advised to wait a little while and to really do it right because more people that are getting a hold of it are really appreciating and, re and um, it's relevant for them. So go to my website, janebulware.com, and it says contact me and I'll sign up. And, and when it becomes available, I'll be reaching out to you. Uh, and if you want to be a part of it or you want to help or you have, you know, you, you really want me to, um, to send you something, let me know. I'd be happy to. Um, but please don't look at me as someone different than you. I'm just a little bit older and hopefully I just turned 60. Um, I've come to realize that um, you, that I don't, I, all of, some of the things that I worried so much about, what other people thought or if I was good enough or et cetera, are not helping you and they're not necessary and that you got this. You totally have this. Don't judge your insides by someone else's outsides because you you got this. I love that. That might have to write that down as a quote. Do not judge your insights by someone else's outsides. If you have not already signed up on Jane's website to get this amazing book, there is so much wisdom. And it also is one of the few books that I've read recently that is truly, truly entertaining. It will share wisdom, but it will also help your development and give you the courage to keep going. Jane, thank you so much for your time. I look forward to following you and your book's journey. Cheryl, as always, it's a pleasure. You said, um, let's make this like we are having a glass of wine together. And there's, and I felt as though, um, I mean, I hope others feel as well that two friends can talk about anything and you don't have to hide anything. And so I appreciate you asking me any qu tough questions that you have. And again, if people want to reach out, I'd be happy to talk to folks. Thank you for inviting me to join you today. Of course. Thanks so much. Take care.